Chapter Thirty One of the Deerslayer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deerslayer by James Fenimore Cooper. Chapter Thirty One. The flower that smiles today, tomorrow dies. All that we wish to stay tempts and then flies. What is this world's delight? Lightning that mocks the night, brief even as bright. Shelley, Mutability, eleven, one through five. The picture next presented by the point of land that the unfortunate Hurons had selected for their last place of encampment need scarcely be laid before the eyes of the reader. Happily for the more tender-minded and the more timid, the trunks of the trees, the leaves, and the smoke had concealed much of that which passed, and night shortly after drew its veil over the lake, and the whole of that seemingly interminable wilderness, which may be said to have then stretched with few and immaterial interruptions from the banks of the Hudson to the shores of the Pacific Ocean. Our business carries us into the following day, when light returned upon the earth, as sunny and as smiling as if nothing extraordinary had occurred. When the sun rose on the following morning, every sign of hostility and alarm had vanished from the basin of the glimmer-glass. The frightful event of the preceding evening had left no impression on the placid sheet, and the untiring hours pursued their course in the placid order prescribed by the powerful hand that set them in motion. The birds were again skimming the water, or were seen poised on the wing, high above the tops of the tallest pines of the mountains, ready to make their swoops, in obedience to the irresistible law of their natures. In a word, nothing was changed but the air of movement and life that prevailed in and around the castle. Here, indeed, was an alteration that must have struck the least observant eye. A sentinel, who wore the light infantry uniform of a royal regiment, paced the platform with measured tread, and some twenty more of the same corps lounged about the place or were seated in the ark. Their arms were stacked under the eye of their comrade on post. Two officers stood examining the shore with the ship's glass so often mentioned. Their looks were directed to that fatal point where scarlet coats were still to be seen gliding among the trees, and where the magnifying power of the instrument also showed spades at work, and the sad duty of interment going on. Several of the common men bore proofs on their persons that their enemies had not been overcome entirely without resistance, and the youngest of the two officers on the platform wore an arm in a sling. His companion, who commanded the party, had been more fortunate. He it was who used the glass in making the reconnaissances in which the two were engaged. A sergeant approached to make a report. He addressed the senior of these officers as Captain Worley, while the other was alluded to as Mr., which was equivalent to Ensign Thornton. The former, it will be at once seen, was the officer who had been named with so much feeling in the parting dialogue between Judith and Hurry. He was in truth the very individual with whom the scandal of the garrisons had most freely connected the name of this beautiful but indiscreet girl. He was a hard-featured, red-faced man of about five-and-thirty, but of a military carriage, and with an air of fashion that might easily impose on the imagination of one as ignorant of the world as Judith. Craig is covering us with benedictions, observed this person to his young ensign, with an air of indifference, as he shut the glass and handed it to his servant. To say the truth, not without reason, it is certainly more agreeable to be here in attendance on Miss Judith Hutter than to be burying Indians on a point of the lake, however romantic the position or brilliant the victory. By the way, right, is Davis still living? He died about ten minutes since, Your Honor returned the sergeant to whom this question was addressed. I knew how it would be, as soon as I found the bullet had touched the stomach. I never knew a man who could hold out long, if he had a hole in his stomach. No, it is rather inconvenient for carrying away anything very nourishing," observed Worley, gaping. This being up two nights to sweet, Arthur, plays the devil with a man's faculties. I'm as stupid as one of those Dutch parsons on the Mohawk. I hope your arm is not painful, my dear boy." "'It draws a few grimaces from me, sir, as I suppose you see,' answered the youth, laughing at the very moment his countenance was a little awry with pain. 
but it may be borne. I suppose Graham can spare a few minutes soon to look at my hurt. She is a lovely creature, this Judith Hutter, after all, Thornton, and it shall not be my fault if she is not seen and admired in the parks," resumed Worley, who thought little of his companion's wound. "'Your arm, eh? Quite true. Go into the ark, Sergeant, and tell Dr. Graham I desire he would look at Mr. Thornton's injury, as soon as he has done with the poor fellow with the broken leg. A lovely creature, and she looked like a queen in that brocade dress in which we met her. I find all changed here, father and mother both gone, the sister dying if not dead, and none of the family left but the beauty. This has been a lucky expedition all round, and promises to terminate better than Indian skirmishes in general. Am I to suppose, sir, that you are about to desert your colors in the great corps of bachelors, and close the campaign with matrimony? I, Tom Worley, turn Benedict? Faith, my dear boy, you little know the corps you speak of, if you fancy any such thing. I do suppose there are women in the colonies that a captain of light infantry need not disdain. But they are not to be found up here on a mountain lake, or even down on the Dutch river where we are posted. It is true, my uncle, the general, once did me the favor to choose a wife for me in Yorkshire. But she had no beauty and I would not marry a princess unless she were handsome. If handsome, you would marry a beggar? Ay, these are the notions of an ensign. Love in a cottage, doors, and windows, the old story for the hundredth time. The twentieth don't marry. We are not a marrying corps, my dear boy. There's the colonel, old Sir Edwin. Now, though a full general, he has never thought of a wife and when a man gets as high as a lieutenant-general without matrimony he is pretty safe. Then the lieutenant-colonel is confirmed, as I tell my cousin the bishop. The major is a widower, having tried matrimony for twelve months in his youth, and we look upon him now as one of our most certain men. Out of ten captains but one is in the dilemma, and he, poor devil, is always kept at regimental headquarters, as a sort of memento mori to the young men as they join. As for the subalterns, not one has ever yet had the audacity to speak of introducing a wife into the regiment. But your arm is troublesome, and we'll go ourselves and see what has become of Graham." The surgeon who had accompanied the party was employed very differently from what the captain supposed. When the assault was over, and the dead and wounded were collected, poor Hetty had been found among the latter. A rifle bullet had passed through her body, inflicting an injury that was known at a glance to be mortal. How this wound was received, no one knew. It was probably one of those casualties that ever accompany scenes like that related in the previous chapter. The sumac, all the elderly women, and some of the Huron girls had fallen by the bayonet, either in the confusion of the melee, or from the difficulty of distinguishing the sexes when the dress was so simple. Much the greater portion of the warriors suffered on the spot. A few had escaped, however, and two or three had been taken unharmed. As for the wounded, the bayonet saved the surgeon much trouble. Rivenoak had escaped with life and limb, but was injured and a prisoner. As Captain Morley and his ensign went into the ark they passed him, seated in dignified silence in one end of the scow, his head and leg bound, but betraying no visible sign of despondency or despair. That he mourned the loss of his tribe is certain. Still he did it in a manner that best became a warrior and a chief. The two soldiers found their surgeon in the principal room of the ark. He was just quitting the pallet of Hetty with an expression of sorrowful regret on his hard pockmarked Scottish features, that it was not usual to see there. All his assiduity had been useless, and he was compelled reluctantly to abandon the expectation of seeing the girl survive many hours. Dr. Graham was accustomed to deathbed scenes, and ordinarily they produced but little impression on him. In all that relates to religion, his was one of those minds which, in consequence of reasoning much on material things, logically and consecutively, and overlooking the total want of premises which such a theory must ever possess, through its want of a primary agent, had become sceptical, leaving a vague opinion concerning the origin of things, that, with high pretensions to philosophy, failed in the first of all philosophical principles, a cause. To him religious dependence appeared a weakness but when he found one gentle and young like Hetty, with a mind beneath the level of her race, sustained at such a moment by these pious sentiments, 
and that too in a way that many a sturdy warrior and reputed hero might have looked upon with envy, he found himself affected by the sight to a degree that he would have been ashamed to confess. Edinburgh and Aberdeen, then as now, supplied no small portion of the medical men of the British service, and Dr. Graham, as indeed his name and countenance equally indicated, was by birth a North Briton. Here is an extraordinary exhibition for a forest, and one but half gifted with reason, he observed with a decided Scottish accent, as Warley and the ensign entered. I just hope, gentlemen, that when we three shall be called on to quit the twentieth, we may be found as resigned to go on the half-pay of another existence as this poor demented child. "'Is there no hope that she can survive the hurt?' demanded Warley, turning his eyes towards the pallid Judith, on whose cheeks, however, two large spots of red had settled as soon as he came into the cabin. "'No more than there is for Charlie Stewart. Approach and judge for yourselves, gentlemen. You'll see faith exemplified in an exceeding and wonderful manner. There is a sort of arbitrium between life and death, in actual conflict in the poor girl's mind, that renders her an interesting study to a philosopher. Mr. Thornton, I'm at your service now. We can just look at the arm in the next room, while we speculate as much as we please on the operations and sinuosities of the human mind." The surgeon and the ensign retired and Morley had an opportunity of looking about him more at leisure, and with a better understanding of the nature and feelings of the group collected in the cabin. Poor Hetty had been placed on her own simple bed, and was reclining in a half-seated attitude, with the approaches of death on her countenance, though they were singularly dimmed by the luster of an expression in which all the intelligence of her entire being appeared to be concentrated. Judith and Hist were near her, the former seated in deep grief the latter standing in readiness to offer any of the gentle attentions of feminine care. Deerslayer stood at the end of the pallet, leaning on Kildeer, unharmed in person, all the fine martial ardor that had so lately glowed in his countenance having given place to the usual look of honesty and benevolence, qualities of which the expression was now softened by manly regret and pity. The serpent was in the background of the picture, erect and motionless as a statue but so observant that not a look of the eye escaped his own keen glances. Hurry completed the group, being seated on a stool near the door, like one who felt himself out of place in such a scene, but who was ashamed to quit it, unbidden. "'Who is that in Scarlet?' asked Hetty, as soon as the captain's uniform caught her eye. "'Tell me, Judith. Is it the friend of Hurry? "'Tis the officer who commands the troops that have rescued us all from the hands of the Hurons,' was the low answer of the sister. Am I rescued, too? I thought they said I was shot and about to die. Mother is dead, and so is father. But you are living, Judith, and so is Hurry. I was afraid Hurry would be killed when I heard him shouting among the soldiers." "'Never mind, never mind, dear Hattie,' interrupted Judith, sensitively alive to the preservation of her sister's secret, more perhaps at such a moment than at any other. Hurry is well, and Deerslayer is well, and the Delaware is well, too. How came they to shoot a poor girl like me, and let so many men go unharmed? I didn't know that the Hurons were so wicked, Judith. It was an accident, poor Hetty. A sad accident it has been. No one would willingly have injured you. I'm glad of that. I thought it strange. I am feeble-minded, and the red men have never harmed me before. I should be sorry to think that they had changed their minds. I am glad, too, Judith, that they haven't hurt hurry. Deerslayer, I don't think God will suffer any one to harm. It was very fortunate the soldiers came as they did, though, for fire will burn. It was indeed fortunate, my sister. God's holy name be forever blessed for the mercy. I dare say, Judith, you know some of the officers. You used to know so many. Judith made no reply. She hid her face in her hands and groaned. Hetty gazed at her in wonder, but naturally supposing her own situation was the cause of this grief, she kindly offered to console her sister. "'Don't mind me, dear Judith,' said the affectionate and pure-hearted creature. "'I don't suffer. If I do die, why father and mother are both dead, and what happens to them may well happen to me. You know I am of less account than any of the family. Therefore few will think of me after I am in the lake.' "'No, no, no, poor dear, dear Hattie!' exclaimed Judith, in an uncontrollable burst of sorrow. "'I at least will ever think of you.' and gladly, oh, how gladly would I exchange places with you, 
to be the pure, excellent, sinless creature you are. Until now, Captain Morley had stood leaning against the door of the cabin. When this outbreak of feeling, and perchance of penitence, however, escaped the beautiful girl, he walked slowly and thoughtfully away, even passing the ensign, then suffering under the surgeon's care, without noticing him. "'I have got my Bible here, Judith,' returned her sister, in a voice of triumph. "'It's true. I can't read any longer. There's something the matter with my eyes. You look dim and distant, and so does Hurry, now I look at him. Well, I never could have believed that Henry March would have so dull a look. What can be the reason, Judith, that I see so badly to-day? I, who mother always said had the best eyes in the whole family. Yes, that was it. My mind was feeble, what people call half-witted, but my eyes were so good." Again Judith groaned. This time no feeling of self, no retrospect of the past, caused the pain. It was the pure heartfelt sorrow of sisterly love, heightened by a sense of the meek humility and perfect truth of the being before her. At that moment she would gladly have given up her own life to save that of Hetty. As the last, however, was beyond the reach of human power, she felt there was nothing left her but sorrow. At this moment Worley returned to the cabin, drawn by a secret impulse he could not withstand, though he felt just then as if he would gladly abandon the American continent for ever, were it practicable. Instead of pausing at the door, he now advanced so near the pallet of the sufferer as to come more plainly within her gaze. Hetty could still distinguish large objects, and her look soon fastened on him. "'Are you the officer that came with hurry?' she asked. "'If you are, we ought all to thank you, for though I am hurt, the rest have saved their lives. Did Harry March tell you where to find us, and how much need there was for your services?' "'The news of the party reached us by means of a friendly runner,' returned the captain, glad to relieve his feelings by this appearance of a friendly communication and I was immediately sent out to cut it off. It was fortunate, certainly, that we met Hurry Harry, as you call him, for he acted as a guide, and it was not less fortunate that we heard a firing, which I now understand was merely a shooting at the mark, for it not only quickened our march, but called us to the right side of the lake. The Delaware saw us on the shore, with the glass it would seem, and he and Hist, as I find his squaw is named, did us excellent service. It was really altogether a fortunate concurrence of circumstances, Judith." "'Talk not to me of anything fortunate, sir,' returned the girl huskily, again concealing her face. "'To me the world is full of misery. I wish never to hear of marks, or rifles, or soldiers, or men, again.' "'Do you know my sister?' asked Hetty, ere the rebuked soldier had time to rally for an answer. "'How came you to know that her name is Judith?' You are right, for that is her name, and I am Hetty, Thomas Hutter's daughters. For heaven's sake, dearest sister, for my sake, beloved Hetty, interposed Judith imploringly, say no more of this. Hetty looked surprised, but accustomed to comply, she ceased her awkward and painful interrogations of Worley, bending her eyes towards the Bible which she still held between her hands, as one would cling to a casket of precious stones in a shipwreck or a conflagration. Her mind now averted to the future, losing sight, in a great measure, of the scenes of the past. "'We shall not long be parted, Judith,' she said. "'When you die you must be brought and be buried in the lake, by the side of mother, too. Would to God, Hetty, that I lay there at this moment! No, that cannot be, Judith. People must die before they have any right to be buried. It would be wicked to bury you, or for you to bury yourself while living. Once I thought of burying myself. God kept me from that sin. "'You! You, Hetty Hutter, think of such an act!' exclaimed Judith, looking up in uncontrollable surprise, for she well knew nothing passed the lips of her conscientious sister that was not religiously true. "'Yes, I did, Judith. But God has forgotten. No, He forgets nothing. But He has forgiven it,' returned the dying girl, with the subdued manner of a repentant child. "'Twas after mother's death. I felt I had lost the best friend I had on earth, if not the only friend. "'Tis true you and father were kind to me, Judith, but I was so feeble-minded I knew I should only give you trouble. And then you were so often ashamed of such a sister and daughter, and tis hard to live in a world where all look upon you as below them. I thought then, if I could bury myself by the side of mother, I should be happier in the lake than in the hut. "'Forgive me. Pardon me, dearest Hetty. On my bended knees I beg you to pardon me, sweet sister, if any word or act of mine—' 
drove you to so maddening and cruel a thought. Get up, Judith. Kneel to God. Don't kneel to me. Just so I felt when Mother was dying. I remembered everything I had said and done to vex her, and could have kissed her feet for forgiveness. I think it must be so with all dying people. Though, now I think of it, I don't remember to have had such feelings on account of father." Judith arose, hid her face in her apron, and wept. A long pause, one of more than two hours, succeeded, during which Worley entered and left the cabin several times, apparently uneasy when absent, and yet unable to remain. He issued various orders, which his men proceeded to execute, and there was an air of movement in the party, more especially as Mr. Craig, the lieutenant, had got through the unpleasant duty of burying the dead, and had sent for instructions from the shore, desiring to know what he was to do with his detachment. During this interval, had he slept a little, and Deerslayer and Chingachgook left the ark to confer together, but at the end of the time mentioned, the surgeon passed upon the platform, and with a degree of feeling his comrades had never before observed in one of his habits, he announced that the patient was rapidly drawing near her end. On receiving this intelligence the group collected again, curiosity to witness such a death, or a better feeling, drawing to the spot men who had so lately been actors in a scene seemingly of so much greater interest and moment. By this time Judith had got to be inactive through grief, and Hist alone was performing the little offices of feminine attention that are so appropriate to the sick-bed. Hetty herself had undergone no other apparent change than the general failing that indicated the near approach of dissolution. All that she possessed of mind was as clear as ever, and, in some respects, her intellect perhaps was more than usually active. "'Don't grieve for me so much, Judith,' said the gentle sufferer, after a pause in her remarks. "'I shall soon see Mother. I think I see her now. Her face is just as sweet and smiling as it used to be. Perhaps when I'm dead God will give me all my mind.' and I shall become a more fitting companion for mother than I ever was before. "'You will be an angel in heaven, Hetty,' sobbed the sister. "'No spirit there will be more worthy of its holy residence.' "'I don't understand it quite. Still, I know it must be all true. I've read it in the Bible. How dark it's becoming! Can it be night so soon? I can hardly see you at all. Where is Hist?' "'I hear, poor girl. Why you no see me?' "'I do see you but I couldn't tell whether twas you or Judith. I believe I shan't see you much longer, Hist. Sorry for that, poor Hetty. Never mind. Pale face got a heaven for girl as well as for warrior. Where's the serpent? Let me speak to him. Give me his hand. So. I feel it. Delaware, you will love and cherish this young Indian woman. I know how fond she is of you. You must be fond of her. Don't treat her as some of your people treat their wives. Be a real husband to her. Now, bring Deerslayer near me. Give me his hand." This request was complied with, and the hunter stood by the side of the pallet, submitting to the wishes of the girl with the docility of a child. "'I feel, Deerslayer,' she resumed, though I couldn't tell why, but I feel that you and I are not going to part for ever. Tis a strange feeling. I never had it before. I wonder what it comes from. Tis God encouraging you in extremity, Hattie. As such it ought to be harbored and respected. Yes, we shall meet again, though it may be a long time first, and in a far distant land. Do you mean to be buried in the lake, too? If so, that may account for the feeling. Tis little likely, gal. Tis little likely. But there's a region for Christian souls where there's no lakes nor woods, they say, though why there should be none of the last is more than I can account for, seeing that pleasantness and peace is the object in view. My grave will be found in the forest, most likely, but I hope my spirit will not be far from yourn. So it must be, then. I am too weak-minded to understand these things, but I feel that you and I will meet again. Sister, where are you? I can't see, now, anything but darkness. It must be night, surely. Oh, Hetty, I am here at your side. These are my arms that are around you, sobbed Judith. Speak, dearest. Is there anything you wish to say or have done? in this awful moment. By this time Hetty's sight had entirely failed her. Nevertheless death approached with less than usual of its horrors, as if in tenderness to one of her half-endowed faculties. She was pale as a corpse, but her breathing was easy and unbroken, while her voice, though lowered almost to a whisper, remained clear and distinct. 
When her sister put this question, however, a blush diffused itself over the features of the dying girl, so faint, however, as to be nearly imperceptible, resembling that hue of the rose which is thought to portray the tint of modesty, rather than the dye of the flower in its richer bloom. No one but Judith detected this exposure of feeling, one of the gentle expressions of womanly sensibility, even in death. On her, however, it was not lost, nor did she conceal from herself the cause. "'Hurry is here, dearest Hetty,' whispered the sister, with her face so near the sufferer as to keep the words from other ears. "'Shall I tell him to come and receive your good wishes?' A gentle pressure of the hand answered in the affirmative. Then Hurry was brought to the side of the pallet. It is probable that this handsome but rude woodsman had never before found himself so awkwardly placed, though the inclination which Hetty felt for him, a sort of secret yielding to the instincts of nature, rather than any unbecoming impulse of an ill-regulated imagination, was too pure and unobtrusive to have created the slightest suspicion of the circumstance in his mind. He allowed Judith to put his hard, colossal hand between those of Hetty, and stood waiting the result in awkward silence. "'This is hurry, dearest,' whispered Judith, bending over her sister, ashamed to utter the word so as to be audible to herself. "'Speak to him, and let him go.' "'What shall I say, Judith?' "'Nay, whatever your own pure spirit teaches, my love, trust to that, and you need fear nothing.' "'Good-bye, hurry,' murmured the girl, with a gentle pressure of his hand. "'I wish you would try and be more like Deerslayer.' These words were uttered with difficulty. A faint flush succeeded them for a single instant. Then the hand was relinquished, and Hetty turned her face aside, as if done with the world. The mysterious feeling that bound her to the young man, a sentiment so gentle as to be almost imperceptible to herself, and which could never have existed at all had her reason possessed more command over her senses, was forever lost in thoughts of a more elevated, though scarcely of a purer character. "'Of what are you thinking, my sweet sister?' whispered Judith. "'Tell me, that I may aid you at this moment.' "'Mother! I see Mother now, and bright beings around her in the lake. Why isn't Father there? It's odd that I can see Mother when I can't see you. Farewell, Judith.' The last words were uttered after a pause, and her sister had hung over her some time in anxious watchfulness before she perceived that the gentle spirit had departed. Thus died Hetty Hutter, one of those mysterious links between the material and immaterial world, which, while they appear to be deprived of so much that it is esteemed and necessary for this state of being, draw so near to, and offer so beautiful an illustration of the truth, purity, and simplicity of another. End of chapter 31 Recording by Bill Borst The Dear Slayer This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deer Slayer by James Fenimore Cooper Chapter 32 a baron's child to be beguiled, it were a cursed deed, to be fellow with an outlaw, almighty God forbid. Yea, better were the poor squire alone to forest yeed, than ye should say, another day, that by my cursed deed ye were betrayed. Wherefore, good maid, the best read that I can, is that I to the green wood go, alone, a banished man. Thomas Percy Nut Brown Maid Eleven, two sixty five to two seventy six, from Relics of Ancient English Poetry, Volume Two. The day that followed proved to be melancholy, though one of much activity. The soldiers who had so lately been employed in interring their victims were now called on to bury their own dead. The scene of the morning had left a saddened feeling on all the gentlemen of the party, and the rest felt the influence of a similar sensation in a variety of ways and from many causes. Hour dragged on after hour, until evening arrived, and then came the last melancholy offices in honor of poor Hetty Hutter. Her body was laid in the lake, by the side of that of the mother she had so loved and reverenced. The surgeon, 
though actually an unbeliever, so far complying with the received decencies of life as to read the funeral service over her grave, as he had previously done over those of the other Christian slain. It mattered not that all-seeing eye which reads the heart could not fail to discriminate between the living and the dead, and the gentle soul of the unfortunate girl was already far removed beyond the errors or deceptions of any human ritual. These simple rites, however, were not wholly wanting in suitable accompaniments. The tears of Judith and Hist were shed freely, and Deerslayer gazed upon the limpid water that now flowed over one whose spirit was even purer than its own mountain springs, with glistening eyes. Even the Delaware turned aside to conceal his weakness, while the common men gazed on the ceremony with wondering eyes and chastened feelings. The business of the day closed with this pious office. By order of the commanding officer all retired early to rest, for it was intended to begin the march homeward with the return of light. One party, indeed, bearing the wounded, the prisoners, and the trophies, had left the castle in the middle of the day, under the guidance of hurry, intending to reach the fort by shorter marches. It had been landed on the point so often mentioned, or that described in our opening pages, and when the sun set was already encamped on the brow of the long, broken, and ridgy hills that fell away towards the valley of the Mohawk. The departure of this detachment had greatly simplified the duty of the succeeding day disencumbering its march of its baggage and wounded, and otherwise leaving him who had issued the order greater liberty of action. Judith held no communication with any but Hist, after the death of her sister, until she retired for the night. Her sorrow had been respected, and both the females had been left with the body, unintruded on, to the last moment. The rattling of the drum broke the silence of that tranquil water, and the echoes of the tattoo were heard among the mountains so soon after the ceremony was over as to preclude the danger of interruption. That star which had been the guide of Hist rose on a scene as silent as if the quiet of nature had never yet been disturbed by the labors or passions of man. One solitary sentinel, with his relief, paced the platform throughout the night, and morning was ushered in, as usual, by the martial beat of the reveille. Military precision succeeded to the desultory proceedings of border men, and when a hasty and frugal breakfast was taken, the party began its movement towards the shore, with the regularity and order that prevented noise or confusion. Of all the officers, Worley alone remained. Craig headed the detachment in advance, Thornton was with the wounded, and Graham accompanied his patients as a matter of course. Even the chest of Hutter, with all the more valuable of his effects, was borne away, leaving nothing behind that was worth the labor of a removal. Judith was not sorry to see that the captain respected her feelings, and that he occupied himself entirely with the duty of his command, leaving her to her own discretion and feelings. It was understood by all that the place was to be totally abandoned, but beyond this no explanations were asked or given. The soldiers embarked in the ark, with the captain at their head. He had inquired of Judith in what way she chose to proceed, and understanding her wish to remain with Hist to the last moment, he neither molested her with requests nor offended her with advice. There was but one safe and familiar trail to the Mohawk, and on that, at the proper hour, he doubted not that they should meet in amity, if not in renewed intercourse. When all were on board, the sweeps were manned, and the ark moved in its sluggish manner towards the distant point. Deerslayer and Chingachgook now lifted two of the canoes from the water, and placed them in the castle. The windows and door were then barred, and the house was left by means of the trap, in the manner already described. On quitting the palisades, Hist was seen in the remaining canoe, where the Delaware immediately joined her, and paddled away, leaving Judith standing alone on the platform. Owing to this prompt proceeding, Deerslayer found himself alone with the beautiful and still weeping mourner. Too simple to suspect anything, the young man swept the light-boat round, and received its mistress in it, when he followed the course already taken by his friend. The direction to the point led diagonally past, and at no great distance from, the graves of the dead. As the canoe glided by, Judith, for the first time that morning, spoke to her companion. She said but little, merely uttering a simple request to stop, for a minute or two, ere she left the place. I may never see this spot again, Deerslayer, she said. 
and it contains the bodies of my mother and sister. Is it not possible, think you, that the innocence of one of these beings may answer in the eyes of God for the salvation of both? I don't understand it so, Judith, though I'm no missionary, and am but poorly taught. Each spirit answers for its own backslidings, though a hearty repentance will satisfy God's laws. Then must my poor mother be in heaven. Bitterly, bitterly has she repented of her sins, and surely her sufferings in this life ought to count as something against her sufferings in the next. All this goes beyond me, Judith. I strive to do right here as the surest means of keeping all right hereafter. Hetty was uncommon, as all that knowed her must allow, and her soul was as fit to consort with angels the hour it left its body as that of any saint in the Bible. I do believe you only do her justice. Alas, alas, that there should be so great differences between those who were nursed at the same breast, slept in the same bed, and dwelt under the same roof. But no matter. Move the canoe a little farther east, dear slayer. The sun so dazzles my eyes that I cannot see the graves. This is Hetty's, on the right of mother's. Sartain, you ask that of us, and all are glad to do as you wish, Judith, when you do that which is right. The girl gazed at him near a minute, in silent attention. Then she turned her eyes backward at the castle. "'This lake will soon be entirely deserted,' she said, and this, too, at a moment when it will be a more secure dwelling-place than ever. What has so lately happened will prevent the Iroquois from venturing again to visit it for a long time to come. "'That it will. Yes. That may be set down as certain. I do not mean to pass this away again so long as the war lasts, for, to my mind, no Huron moccasin will leave its print on the leaves of this forest, until their traditions have forgotten to tell their young men of their disgrace and rout. And do you so delight in violence and bloodshed? I had thought better of you, dear Slayer, believed you one who could find his happiness in a quiet domestic home, with an attached and loving wife ready to study your wishes, and healthy and dutiful children anxious to follow in your footsteps and to become as honest and just as yourself. Lord Judith, what a tongue you're mistress of! Speech and looks go hand in hand, like, and what one can't do the other is pretty certain to perform. Such a gal, in a month, might spoil the stoutest warrior in the colony. And am I then so mistaken? Do you really love war, dear slayer, better than the hearth and the affections? I understand your meaning, gal. Yes, I do. I understand what you mean, I believe, though I don't think you altogether understand me. Warrior I may now call myself, I suppose, for I've both fought and conquered, which is sufficient for the name. Neither will I deny that I've feelings for the colon, which is both manful and honorable when carried on according to natural gifts. But I've no relish for blood. Youth is youth, howsoever, and a mingo is a mingo. If the young men of this region stood by and suffered the vagabonds to overrun the land, why, we might as well all turn Frenchers at once, and give up country and kin. I'm no fire-eater, Judith, or one that likes fightin' for fightin's sake. But I can see no great difference atween givin' up territory afore a war, out of a dread of war, and givin' it up atter a war, because we can't help it, unless it be that the last is the most manful and honorable. No woman would ever wish to see her husband or brother stand by and submit to insult and wrong, dear Slayer, however she might mourn the necessity of his running into the dangers of battle. But you've done enough already, in clearing this region of the Hurons, since to you is principally owing the credit of our late victory. Now listen to me patiently, and answer me with that native honesty which it is as pleasant to regard in one of your sex as it is unusual to meet with." Judith paused for now that she was on the very point of explaining herself, native modesty asserted its power, notwithstanding the encouragement and confidence she derived from the great simplicity of her companion's character. Her cheeks, which had so lately been pale, flushed, and her eyes lighted with some of their former brilliancy. Feeling gave expression to her countenance and softness to her voice, rendering her, who was always beautiful, trebly seductive and winning. "'Dear Slayer,' she said, after a considerable pause, this is not a moment for affectation, deception, or want of frankness of any sort. Here, over my mother's grave, and over the grave of truth-loving, truth-telling Hetty, everything like unfair dealing seems to be out of place. 
I will therefore speak to you without any reserve, and without any dread of being misunderstood. You are not an acquaintance of a week, but it appears to me as if I had known you for years. So much, and so much that is important, has taken place within that short time, that the sorrows and dangers and escapes of a whole life have been crowded into a few days, and they who have suffered and acted together in such scenes ought not to feel like strangers. I know that what I am about to say might be misunderstood by most men, but I hope for a generous construction of my course from you. We are not here dwelling among the arts and deceptions of the settlements, but young people who have no occasion to deceive each other, in any manner or form. I hope I make myself understood. Sartain, Judith, few converse better than yourself, and none more agreeable like. Your words are as pleasant as your looks. It is the manner in which you have so often praised those looks that gives me courage to proceed. Still, dear Slayer, it is not easy for one of my sex and years to forget all her lessons of infancy, all her habits, and her natural diffidence, and say openly what her heart feels. Why not, Judith? Why shouldn't women as well as men deal fairly and honestly by their fellow-creatures? I see no reason why you should not speak as plainly as myself when there is anything really important to be said. This indomitable diffidence, which still prevented the young man from suspecting the truth, would have completely discouraged the girl had not her whole soul, as well as her whole heart, been set upon making a desperate effort to rescue herself from a future that she dreaded, with a horror as vivid as the distinctness with which she fancied she foresaw it. This motive, however, raised her above all common considerations and she persevered even to her own surprise, if not to her great confusion. I will, I must deal as plainly with you as I would with poor dear Hetty, were that sweet child living, she continued, turning pale instead of blushing, the high resolution by which she was prompted reversing the effect that such a procedure would ordinarily produce on one of her sex. Yes, I will smother all other feelings in the one that is now uppermost. You love the woods and the life that we pass here, in the wilderness, away from the dwellings and the towns of the whites. As I loved my parents, Judith, when they was living, this very spot would be all creation to me, could this war be fairly over, once, and the settlers kept at a distance. Why quit it, then? It has no owner, at least none who can claim a better right than mine, and that I freely give to you. Were it a kingdom, dear slayer, I think I should delight to say the same. Let us, then, return to it, after we have seen the priest at the fort, and never quit it again, until God calls us away to that world where we shall find the spirits of my poor mother and sister." A long thoughtful pause succeeded. Judith here covered her face with both her hands, after forcing herself to utter so plain a proposal, and Deerslayer musing equally in sorrow and surprise on the meaning of the language he had just heard. At length the hunter broke the silence, speaking in a tone that was softened to gentleness by his desire not to offend. "'You haven't thought well of this, Judith,' he said. "'No, your feelings are awakened by all that has lately happened. And believing yourself to be without kindred in the world, you are in too great haste to find some to fill the places of them that's lost. Were I living in a crowd of friends, dear Slayer, I should still think as I now think. Say as I now say, returned Judith, speaking with her hands still shading her lovely face. Thank you, gal, thank you, from the bottom of my heart. Howsever, I am not one to take advantage of a weak moment, when you are forgetful of your own great advantages and fancy earth and all it holds is in this little canoe. No, no, Judith, t'would be ungenerous of me. What you've offered can never come to pass. It all may be, and that without leaving cause of repentance to any," answered Judith, with an impetuosity of feeling and manner that at once unveiled her eyes. We can cause the soldiers to leave our goods on the road till we return, when they can easily be brought back to the house. The lake will be no more visited by the enemy, this war at least. All your skins may be readily sold at the garrison. There you can buy the few necessaries we shall want, for I wish never to see the spot again. And Deerslayer, added the girl, smiling with a sweetness and nature that the young man found it hard to resist, as a proof how holy I am and wish to be yours, how completely I desire to be nothing but your wife, 
the very first fire that we kindle, after our return, shall be lighted with the brocade dress, and fed by every article I have, that you may think unfit for the woman you wish to live with. Osme, You are winning and a lovely creature, Judith. Yes, you are all that, and no one can deny it and speak truth. These pictures are pleasant to the thoughts, but they mightn't prove so happy as you now think em. Forget it all, therefore, and let us paddle after the sarpent and hist, as if nothing had been said on the subject." Judith was deeply mortified, and what is more, she was profoundly grieved. Still, there was a steadiness and quiet in the manner of Deerslayer that completely smothered her hopes, and told her that for once her exceeding beauty had failed to excite the admiration and homage it was wont to receive. Women are said seldom to forgive those who slight their advances, but this high-spirited and impetuous girl entertained no shadow of resentment, then or ever, against the fair, dealing, and ingenuous hunter. At the moment the prevailing feeling was the wish to be certain that there was no misunderstanding. After another painful pause, therefore, she brought the matter to an issue by a question too direct to admit of equivocation. God forbid that we lay up regrets in after-life, through my want of sincerity now, she said. I hope we understand each other at least. You will not accept me for a wife, dear Slayer. Tis better for both that I shouldn't take advantage of your own forgetfulness, Judith. We can never marry. You do not love me? Cannot find it in your heart, perhaps, to esteem me, dear Slayer? Everything in the way of friendship, Judith, everything even to services and life itself, Yes, I'd risk as much for you at this moment as I would risk in behalf of Hist, and that is saying as much as I can say of any darter of woman. I do not think I feel towards either, mind I say either, Judith, as if I wished to quit father and mother, if father and mother was livin', which, howsoever, neither is. But if both was livin', I do not feel towards any woman as if I wished to quit em in order to cleave unto her. This is enough, answered Judith in a rebuked and smothered voice. I understand all that you mean. Marry you cannot with loving, and that love you do not feel for me. Make no answer if I am right, for I shall understand your silence. That will be painful enough of itself." Deerslayer obeyed her, and he made no reply. For more than a minute the girl riveted her bright eyes on him as if to read his soul, while he was playing with the water like a corrected schoolboy. Then Judith herself dropped the end of her paddle and urged the canoe away from the spot, with a movement as reluctant as the feelings which controlled it. Deerslayer quietly aided the effort, however, and they were soon on the trackless line taken by the Delaware. In their way to the point not another syllable was exchanged between Deerslayer and his fair companion. As Judith sat in the bow of the canoe, her back was turned towards him else it is probable the expression of her countenance might have induced him to venture some soothing terms of friendship and regard. Contrary to what would have been expected, resentment was still absent, though the color frequently changed from the deep flush of mortification to the paleness of disappointment. Sorrow, deep, heartfelt sorrow, however, was the predominant emotion, and this was betrayed in a manner not to be mistaken. As neither labored hard at the paddle, the ark had already arrived and the soldiers had disembarked before the canoe of the two loiterers reached the point. Chingachgook had preceded it, and was already some distance in the wood, at a spot where the two trails, that to the garrison and that to the villages of the Delawares, separated. The soldiers, too, had taken up their line of march, first setting the ark adrift again with a reckless disregard of its fate. All this Judith saw but she heeded it not. The glimmer-glass had no longer any charms for her, and when she put her foot on the strand she immediately proceeded on the trail of the soldiers without casting a single glance behind her. Even Hist was passed unnoticed, that modest young creature shrinking from the averted face of Judith, as if guilty herself of some wrong-doing. "'Wait you here, Serpent,' said Deerslayer, as he followed in the footsteps of the dejected beauty, while passing his friend. I will just see Judith among her party, and come and join you." A hundred yards had hid the couple from those in front, as well as those in their rear, when Judith turned and spoke. "'This will do, dear Slayer,' she said sadly. "'I understand your kindness, but shall not need it. 
In a few minutes I shall reach the soldiers. As you cannot go with me on the journey of life, I do not wish you to go further on this. But stop, before we part, I would ask you a single question, and I require of you, as you fear God and reverence for the truth, not to deceive me in your answer. I know you do not love another, and I can see but one reason why you cannot, will not love me. Tell me then, dear Slayer, the girl paused, the words she was about to utter seeming to choke her, then rallying all her resolution, with a face that flushed and paled at every breath she drew, she continued, "'Tell me then, dear Slayer, if anything light of me, that Henry March has said, may not have influenced your feelings.' Truth was dear Slayer's polar star. He ever kept it in view, and it was nearly impossible for him to avoid uttering it, even when prudence demanded a silence. Judith read his answer in his countenance, and with a heart nearly broken by the consciousness of undue erring, she signed to him an adieu, and buried herself in the woods. For some time Deerslayer was irresolute as to his course, but in the end he retraced his steps, and joined the Delaware. That night the three camped on the headwaters of their own river, and the succeeding evening they entered the village of the tribe, Chingachgook and his betrothed in triumph their companion honored and admired, but in a sorrow that it required months of activity to remove. The war that then had its rise was stirring and bloody. The Delaware chief rose among his people, until his name was never mentioned without eulogiums, while another Uncas, the last of his race, was added to the long line of warriors who bore that distinguishing appellation. As for Deerslayer, under the sobriquet of Hawkeye, he made his fame spread far and near until the crack of his rifle became as terrible to the ears of the Mingos as the thunders of the Manitou. His services were soon required by the officers of the Crown, and he especially attached himself in the field to one in particular, with one whose after life he had a close and important connection. Fifteen years had passed away ere it was in the power of the Deerslayer to visit the Glimmerglass. A peace had intervened, and it was on the eve of another and still more important war when he and his constant friend, Chingachgook, were hastening to the forts to join their allies. A stripling accompanied them, for Hist already slumbered beneath the pines of the Delawares, and the three survivors had now become inseparable. They reached the lake just as the sun was setting. Here all was unchanged. The river still rushed through its bower of trees, the little rock was washing away by the slow action of the waves in the course of centuries. The mountains stood in their native dress, dark, rich, and mysterious, while the sheet glistened in its solitude, a beautiful gem of the forest. The following morning the youth discovered one of the canoes drifted on the shore, in a state of decay. A little labor put it in a state for service, and they all embarked, with a desire to examine the place. All the points were passed, and Chingachgook pointed out to his son the spot where the Hurons had first encamped and the point whence he had succeeded in stealing his bride. Here they even landed, but all traces of the former visit had disappeared. Next they proceeded to the scene of the battle, and there they found a few of the signs that linger around such localities. Wild beasts had disinterred many of the bodies, and human bones were bleaching in the rains of summer. Uncas regarded all with reverence and pity, though traditions were already rousing his young mind to the ambition and sternness of a warrior. From the point, the canoe took its way toward the shoal, where the remains of the castle were still visible a picturesque ruin. The storms of winter had long since unroofed the house, and decay had eaten into the logs. All the fastenings were untouched. But the seasons rioted in the place, as if in mockery at the attempt to exclude them. The palisades were rotting, as were the piles, and it was evident that a few more recurrences of winter, a few more gales and tempests, would sweep all into the lake and blot the building from the face of that magnificent solitude. The graves could not be found. Either the elements had obliterated their traces, or time had caused them who looked for them to forget their position. The ark was discovered stranded on the eastern shore, where it had long before been driven by the prevalent northwest winds. It lay on the sandy extremity of a long low point, that is situated about two miles from the outlet, and which is itself fast disappearing before the action of the elements. The scow was filled with water, the cabin unroofed, and the logs were decaying. 
Some of its coarser furniture still remained, and the heart of Deerslayer beat quick as he found a ribbon of Judith's fluttering from a log. It recalled all her beauty, and we may add all her failings, although the girl had never touched his heart. The Hawkeye, for so we ought now to call him, still retained a kind and sincere interest in her welfare. He tore away the ribbon, and knotted it to the stock of Kildeer, which had been the gift of the girl herself. A few miles farther up the lake, another of the canoes was discovered, and on the point where the party finally landed were found those which had been left there upon the shore. That in which the present navigation was made, and the one discovered on the eastern shore, had dropped through the decayed floor of the castle, drifted past the falling palisades, and had been thrown as waifs upon the beach. From all these signs, it was probable the lake had not been visited since the occurrence of the final scene of our tale. Accident or tradition had rendered it again a spot sacred to nature, the frequent wars and the feeble population of the colonies still confining the settlements within narrow boundaries. Chingachgook and his friend left the spot with melancholy feelings. It had been the region of their first war-path, and it carried back the minds of both to scenes of tenderness as well as to hours of triumph. They held their way towards the Mohawk in silence, however, to rush into new adventures as stirring and as remarkable as those which had attended their opening careers on this lovely lake. At a later day they returned to the place where the Indian found a grave. Time and circumstances have drawn an impenetrable mystery around all else connected with the Hutters. They lived, erred, and died, and are forgotten. None connected have felt sufficient interest in the disgraced and disgracing to withdraw the veil, and a century is about to erase even the recollection of their names. The history of crime is ever revolting, and it is fortunate that few love to dwell on its incidents. The sins of the family have long since been arraigned at the judgment seat of God, or are registered for the terrible settlement of the last great day. The same fate attended Judith. When Hawkeye reached the garrison on the Mohawk, he inquired anxiously after that lovely but misguided creature. None knew her. Even her person was no longer remembered. Other officers had again and again succeeded the Worleys and Craigs and Grahams, though an old sergeant of the garrison, who had lately come from England, was enabled to tell our hero that Sir Robert Worley lived on his paternal estates and that there was a lady of rare beauty in the lodge who had great influence over him, though she did not bear his name. Whether this was Judith relapsed into her early failing, or some other victim of the soldiers, Hawkeye never knew, nor would it be pleasant or profitable to inquire. We live in a world of transgressions and selfishness, and no pictures that represent us otherwise can be true, though happily for human nature gleamings of that pure spirit in whose likeness man has been fashioned are to be seen, relieving its deformities, and mitigating, if not excusing, its crimes. End of chapter 32 and End of the Deerslayer by James Fenimore Cooper Recording by Bill Borst